hello. So we're going to go over a trial on oscillococcinum today. It was published in the British Homeopathic Journal in 1998. Um, and so the British Homeopathic Journal is homeopathy now uh, these days. Um, so if you don't know oscillococcinum, it's a remedy prescribed in the treatment or prevention of flu. It's not really homeopathic because a proving has not been done. We don't know what it does to the healthy body. It was sort of intended to be isopathic, I think, um, but it was it was done before we had isolated the influenza virus, I believe, and so it's not truly isopathic. Um, you can, yeah, it's a wild story if you want to look it up in your, <laughs> in your spare time. Oh, what homeopaths do, although I wouldn't call it homeopath. And yeah, anyway, okay. So oscillococcinum is sold by Boyron, and. So the data we have on it is largely funded by Boyron, and this is not an exception. So um, Rosemary Papp, the first author, is generally the one who does all of the grunt work, does the actual study, all the work. Um, as you go down in the authorship list, it's more people who provided funding, who um, maybe provided the clinics where the patients came from, um, stuff like that. So, you know, if you're getting your PhD, for example, the PhD candidate would be first who did all the work. The um, advisor and head of department, that stuff, these are the guys who are going to be at the very end. And so Philippe Ballon, let's look at him. He's the last one. Three crosses. And then if you go down to three crosses, you will see that, in fact, he is affiliated with Boyron. So this is an industry-funded study, most likely, um, and so all results should be taken with a grain of salt for that reason. If we're going to be suspicious of industry funded studies in pharma and nutraceuticals, we should do the same in homeopathy, at least that's what I think. Um, so it's a lovely trial in that it's placebo controlled and the placebo from the sound of it, they, because it was with Boyron, they were able to essentially take the exact same pellets and some medicated, some were not. Um, and so truly you could not tell a difference between placebo and true treatment. Um, double blind, so that means the physicians didn't know who was getting uh, treatment versus placebo, and the patients didn't know who was getting uh, treatment versus placebo, <laughs> which is great. So this is gold standard randomized control trial, okay? Um so they had a lot of endpoints, a lot of endpoints, uh, which, as I've said before, usually means they're fishing, um, usually means they're working real hard to try and get one positive outcome, um, which, of course, all people are, because usually funding is related to getting positive outcomes. So, of course, you look at 15,000 different outcomes, because hopefully one of them is going to be statistically significant, which is what we need, statistical significance. So they looked at um, the physicians reported things um, and the patients reported things. So the, um, and they reported 48 hours after treatment, seven to 10, and seven to 10 days after treatment. And they of course had baseline beginning of treatment. Um, for the first few days, patients recorded their rectal temperature twice a day, those poor people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they also did a nine-symptom ra uh, rating scale um, and reported use of medication. If they took medication, they were excluded from the study um, because, you know, so if they were reporting pain and they took uh, Advil, they were excluded from the study, which would make sense, right, because that would mess up your results. And they decided recovery meant... Uh, Rectal temperature less than 37.5 degrees Celsius, so no fever, no headache or muscle pain. Effectiveness of the treatment was defined as statistically significant decrease in symptoms after 48 hours in the treatment group or a shorter duration of symptoms in comparison to placebo. Um, they met this definition. So they did have a statistical significant, I can never say it, my words always get <laughs> stuck, they had a statistically significant decrease in symptoms after 48 hours, and their p-value was 
0.023. So this means there is a 2.3 chance these results are only due to chance. That's what a p-value means. And the point is to try and control for the fact that, you know, so if you have a perfect coin and you do a coin toss heads or tails you you if you do it 100 times you may not get 50 50 you might get 49 51 you might get 40 60 and that's just due to chance because you know <laughs> statistics are funny right because every single time you throw the coin you still have a 50 50 shot it's not like because you got head last time you'll get tails this time um so the p-value is to control for the fact that even if something is due to chance, you might get things weighted in one direction or another. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so the number of uh, patients with no symptoms was, was significantly higher in the treatment group on, from the second day onwards. Treatment was 17.4 and placebo was 6.6. .6. That sounds high. Um, I don't mean that in a in a like I think they did something wrong, like it sounds good, 17.4 versus 6.6, .6, but I would be very, very cautious because they are not reporting p-values here, and there's a lot of funny business you could play with statistics like that. Um, and then they have a lot of other numbers, and I don't want this to turn into a numbers game, so I will just skip them, um, but they are here for you to read if you want to. Um, they Their takeaway was that it showed... Um, that oscillococcinum has a positive effect on the decline of symptoms and the duration of the disease. Um, so I would say this does seem to have a mild positive benefit. Now, what does that mean? So um, I would also say they, this is a repeat of a study done by Furley et al. I will try and find that study and do it again at another day, too, um, just out of curiosity to compare the two. Um, so first of all, I think it's awesome that we are repeating studies. I don't think that's off, that's done enough because it's not really sexy to repeat something that's already been done. But they got very similar results to Furley et al. So that's very encouraging. But what does that mean for prescriptive purposes? So like I said, this is not really homeopathic. We don't we don't know what oscillococcinum does. So I, for one, would not really feel comfortable ever prescribing it. Um. And it's often taken prophylactically instead of for treatment, and this is a for treatment study. So this is not at all about prophylaxis, but whether or not when you st if you're getting influenza-like symptoms and then you start taking it, whether or not you improve faster than placebo, and they seem to have a mild positive effect on treatment of influenza. Um, so, you know, I don't... I don't find the results myself exciting enough to suddenly stop being a homeopath and prescribe this because the study had a positive effect, but maybe you want to try it. Maybe you don't feel well and you're like, oh, well, maybe I'll give it a go, right? <laughs> they also did report adverse events, which is lovely, and um, they didn't have any except potentially a mild headache. Um, so, you know, it's we can consider it relatively safe. Their takeaways, though, I do think are very fair. They, you know, say the effect was modest. Ooh, sorry, I just crossed out of it. The effect was modest, but nevertheless of interest. And I would, I would say that's about bang on as far as I'm concerned. Relatively interesting, not like earth-shattering, relatively interesting. <laughs>